right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome back to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Dom Pizzette, and we are diving back into the world of CompTIA IT fundamentals. In fact, in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at, well, computer hardware, lots and lots of stuff. We've got uh, gadgets sitting here on the table, which always <laughs> tells me we're about to have a good episode, because uh, I love kind of seeing all the technology that's behind the scenes. And here to help us see all of that is, once again, Mr. Ronnie Wong. Ronnie, thanks for joining us. Well, Don, thank you for having me back on the show as we now take a look at, well, some additional hardware. Now, when I say additional hardware, Don, it's, it's kind of a little bit backward here. We're not saying that we've done everything else and now we're just throwing in some extras. We're now talking about the idea of common hardware. In other words, regardless of what type of computing device that you're on, whether you're using a smartphone or whether you're using a laptop or a desktop computer, or maybe even a webcam, you at least have these common elements among them uh, that we need to understand that they're part of everything that's out there. And we just wanted to show those components to you and make sure that you understood what you're trying to actually work with just about in every device that's out there because it is important that uh, we don't uh, segment off and go, oh, no, that, that doesn't apply here and that doesn't. There are some common types of hardware uh, which is shared among every computing device and that's what we want to go to as well, and I, I left out a category there, right? Things like smartwatches that are out there today. You name it, it doesn't matter. The size or the actual capacity, going from the smallest uh, you know, a type of computing device to even large servers, we're gonna see this type of hardware in them. All right, well, Ronnie, I know there's a handful of components that every computer's gonna have, and I'm trying to think, in, in my opinion, which one is the most important. And, and probably the most important is the processor because right. I know I think we described that in an earlier episode as being like the brain or the heart and soul of our computer so when it comes to the world of, of processors what what does that hardware look like what, what, what can we expect to see with a processor in a computer yeah when it comes down to processors this is what you're gonna actually end up seeing in, in a couple of different things right uh, overall though the processor is uh, if we use an analogy let's use the the idea of the body analogy here the processor is the brains of the computer it does all the processing that we need, all the math, all the arithmetic, everything that we need to end up with a different product than what we started off with, it's gonna go through the processor itself and it's gonna find uh, you know, uh, its ability, right? It's gonna be programmed in there from the factory of how fast it can do the stuff that it needs to do. It's gonna have all of that in there. Now, the weird thing is when you hear about all the amazing things that processors can do and how fast that they can do them, it really doesn't look that impressive overall, Don, when it comes down to it. So uh, I'm gonna see if I can pull this one up here, okay, so that we can actually take a look at it. So uh, let's see if I hold it uh, the, the right way. So there it is, Don. Uh, it looks just like, uh, you know, uh, the back of a watch uh, is what it actually looks like, the back of a square watch on this side. This is the, sur the top surface of the processor, but on the bottom side, a little bit more of shiny, okay? Now, what looks almost like a, a reflective gold piece there is actually hundreds, if, if not maybe close, you know, I'm gonna say hundreds of little tiny gold pins that are sticking directly out and facing you on, on the camera. And each one of those pins are gonna be important in how much it can actually do, how fast it can do the information it needs to, and they're actually assigned to, to what they actually need to be doing at any one point in time. So this idea of the processor itself, okay, is by far the most important component that we have because without it, it doesn't matter how much information we send, it's not gonna do anything with it. With this though, it will actually do everything that we want it to do or at least what we tell it to do, uh, it's gonna actually be done right here on this chip. Now a processor is actually an incredibly complex right. device and when we look at it, it yeah. looks just like a solid chunk of metal, right. right? And the reason you'll see that, you'll actually see this kind of as a recurring theme with a lot of hardware is because processors generate a lot of heat and we have to dissipate that heat, we have to get it out of there. And so in order to facilitate that, they embed it in a casing that basically conducts heat, allows it to move out. So it's not much to look at, but it is insanely complex. And, and Ron, you might know this better than me, inside of the processor, there's transistors. Right. And not just a few transistors, literally millions, millions of transistors. These are micro components. So that little box he was holding up actually has millions of pieces inside. It, I, I can't even picture no. a million pennies in right. front of me. Better yet, a million transistors inside of that little box. Yeah, it is amazing because all of those million processes, right? They operate at such a high speed. That's where the heat gets generated. And then, you know, it does it so quickly as well. And that's what we want it to do, right? So when you start to see something like this, the processors, remember, they're normally measured by a speed that we talk about in terms of gigahertz. 
And that means it processes so much uh, at one particular time uh, when we start doing that. So that's the, the idea here. Okay, so the processor is the brains and everything that we actually need to do, that's actually important. Now, when we start to take a look at that processor though, okay, they can come in different sizes though, Don, and that's the kind of key as well. So on this one, well, Don, this wouldn't fit in something like an Apple smartwatch very well, okay, nor in something like a webcam. Could we put it in there? Not easily, okay? So processors come in different sizes for different applications, and I can actually show you one that's actually a lot smaller than this, Don. So uh, let me go ahead and show you that one too. Uh, let me see if I can pull this one up, okay? Now, Don, I'm actually showing more than, than just the processor here, but uh, if I can hold this one up, you can see that there's a chip right here in the center, and that one, by comparison, if I try and hold them up beside me, okay, you can see the actual size difference where that little black square that I have uh, is actually the processor on this board, whereas this is actually just the processor itself and what it can do, okay? So on this one, it has that same capacity to be able to do all of the different things that we're talking about here. So let me hold them side by side like this, okay? Uh, because, well, it's the same thing. It's actually doing all the processing for this small device as it's doing for this one. And depending on the component that it's working with, that's why it doesn't really need to generate a ton. It's allowing it to work at, uh, for a certain uh, process that we want to do, but it's not allowing it to do maybe everything that this thing can actually handle to be able to do as well. Yeah, you know, the, the computer you've got in your right hand, it actually is a whole computer, right? right? It's called a Raspberry Pi, and it has video and storage and memory and network and all of that other stuff built right into that one little board. And it's talking about form factor, getting things small, small, small. And when you get things really small, heat becomes a problem. How do you get the heat out of there? So devices, like, well, you mentioned like a, a smartwatch, right? Uh, they don't have fans in them to blow the heat out. So they have processes that run slower. They're not as powerful. They're smaller. They're more compact. But in a desktop, we have a lot more room, right? We have a bigger room, and, and we're more worried about power. We want that power. We want it to run faster. And so it's okay that the processor is bigger. That doesn't mean that it's a worse technology or an older technology. It means it's more powerful. They're very similar to cars. If you get a little mm -hmm. tiny car, it's usually a, a lot weaker than a, a bigger, powerful car. Now, in order for that to work, though, obviously with Raspberry Pi, an entire computer is <laughs> fit inside of a little board. With a regular PC, it's not like that. So what, what does it look like when we get into the world of a regular PC? Yeah, when we get into the world of a regular PC, this is where it comes down to actually using something in the same similar fashion. But now it's actually much bigger. So Don, I'm going to get you to hold up the motherboard here. And uh, this motherboard that you're actually seeing, well, by comparison, it's the combination, right, uh, of what we can see here. Let me see if I can give a, a size comparison, okay? So that's equatable. The only thing that this one's missing is the CPU, which I did not put back then there for fear of bending the pins right now. And you do want to be careful if you're taking these things out. But yeah, this is equatable. Now, will this one do as much as this one? No, this one's actually designed to handle a lot more as than this one, okay? So that's what we're talking about instead. Now, Don, we can also go into the realm where you might see more than one processor on a board as well. If you hear about that, more than likely it's actually in the, the kind of uh, a server environment, right? The very fact that you have uh, uh, computers out there that are designed to handle so much more that it needs an additional processor on the board as well, and it can handle a lot more of the functions that you see. So all of these different uh, aspects that we see right here are for connections that we can make to the motherboard. And since Don is actually holding it up, that's a good time for us to talk about this idea of the motherboard as well. The very fact is the motherboard, if we use the same analogy where the CPU itself is the brain of the computer, well, the motherboard is like the central nervous system. In other words, the spine of the body. This is the spine of the computer. Everything that we need directly connects to this board so it can send it to the processor to be processed as well, okay? And so that's why this is actually very important. And you can buy these things on your own and spec out what you need. If you want additional RAM, uh, you can have more slots for RAM. If you need more expansion, you can even see that there's actually other slots that are there so that you can expand the capabilities. So every motherboard gives us some certain basic capabilities that are on the motherboard itself. But then if you need to expand it, then you can add in additional components to help you. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of hard to see, uh, well, when I'm holding it like yeah. this earlier, but even even standing here looking at it, it's hard to see that what a motherboard really is, is a, a wafer of, of silicon, usually, yeah. right? Uh, and it has thousands of wires inside of it. And what the wires are doing are connecting all of these parts 
to the CPU. If you ever have a chance to pick up a motherboard like this, uh, you can flip it over and look on the back side, and it's usually pretty easy to spot where the CPU goes because it'll have some kind of mounting bracket on it. But you can start to see some of the little embedded wires in the motherboard because they're not covered with components on the bottom. And all of those wires are like a highway system that's going back to the CPU, right? The CPU is controlling all of the components plugged into this board, and it's able to see that thanks to the motherboard. Right. So if your if your CPU fails, it's like your brain shuts off in a human, right? If the motherboard fails, the brain can't talk to the rest of the body. The whole system breaks down. These are both very very critical components, and appearance wise. Ronnie, they don't, they don't all look no. like this, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, a lot of them don't actually have some of the fancy features that we see on here. So, for example, those blue things that we saw that were sticking directly out of the motherboard itself. Uh, let me see if I can point this one out here. So, like these things right here, they're nice and shiny, and they're made out of pieces of aluminum. Well, those are heat sinks to help dissipate some of the heat, and even the colors of them are matched for a particular style as well. If you want to add lighting, you're going to add blue lighting to this thing. But... <laughs> they don't always have to actually look exactly like this. Some of them look fairly plain by comparison, but this is actually designed probably to go into a system that you're going to display fairly, you know, with a nice kind of uh, window plate and so that you can see everything that's actually in them. A lot of systems are so jam-packed with stuff that you close them up inside of the, the case, like, for example, a server, you don't ever actually see what the actual motherboard looks like. It looks fairly similar, but just not as fancy. Yeah, if you were to open up a laptop, for example, they know you're never going to see the components in there, so they don't bother painting them pretty blue. Right. They're just whatever color the metal is out of the factory, and they work in a smaller space, so they don't stick out of the board as much as some of these do. So definitely some good variation there. But also just the size of the motherboard. When you look at computers, look at the case that the computer is in. They come in all sorts of different sizes and flavors. And while there are official standards that dictate how the motherboard should be shaped, any vendor can choose not to follow those standards. Yeah. And oftentimes you'll see where Lenovo, Dell, HP, where they make specialized computers that are focused more on the appearance than they are on following a standard. Uh, Apple did that. The you know they had the the computer that looked like a trash can. It was oh like yeah, a round that's one, right. Right. Yeah. You can't follow a motherboard <laughs> standard to make a round computer that doesn't work. So they just didn't follow the standard, which which is fine. You know, most people don't expect to upgrade their computers like we we used to. With this motherboard, we can add components. We can take components out. With that Raspberry Pi Zero that, that Ronnie held up, you can't add <laughs> memory to it. You can't upgrade the processor. It's all soldered directly onto that board. So it's a very purpose-built system and not something that's upgradable. So uh, unfortunately, that day and age, I think, has right. sailed. That We used to all upgrade our computers over time. Now people upgrade by buying new computers. There's no doubt that that's uh, the truth. And speaking of that, Don, when we talk about motherboards not looking the same, if I hold up this Raspberry Pi again, okay, right here, um, we also find out that sometimes they combine components all together into one chip. So because there's not a lot of space, there's not extra room for a, a module of RAM that goes in this. So they've combined essentially the RAM underneath the actual CPU, or actually the RAM, yeah, uh, the CPU underneath the RAM, I was trying to make sure I, I said that. So all on one die is what they actually ended up doing. And you might find that in a lot of the smaller components where they just combine all these elements together into one. So even though it may not look super, you know, like, uh, you know, neat or, or you know, uh, something fancy, it still has all those basic components that we've been talking about in them. And it really helps us out to be able to do that, too. So the CPU, the motherboard itself, these are probably going to be the components that you'll find, like I said, in every single device that's out there, too. Yeah, and the industry term that you'll hear is SOC or system on chip where the one chip contains effectively a, a miniature motherboard inside of it and the individual components. I mentioned how the CPU is kind of like the, the brain of mm -hmm. this, right? And I mentioned how when I held up the motherboard, all the devices ran back to the processor. Well, that's true, so I, I didn't lie. <laughs> but there are certain operations that uh, depend more on accessing memory than accessing CPU. But the CPU does act as kind of that gatekeeper and it provides access to memory. So RAM is obviously a very important aspect of using a computer. And on the Raspberry Pi, we can't we can't no. see that memory. It's embedded in the chip, right? But on the motherboard, we can. So Ronnie, let's talk a little bit about that RAM. All right. So Don's going to hold this up again, and we'll actually be able to see this once more. So here's the actual CPU. But because the CPU itself can't access everything because the well the die itself is not big enough to have all the RAM on it, 
it will offload or it will actually say, look, I need a place where I can actually have additional memory. And up here at the top, there's four additional slots and you see them with these color code, with this uh, kind of a sticker on them that shows that those that RAM is actually right there. And there's actually a heat sink on every one of those uh, RAM sticks as well. And let's see if we can pull one out, Don. And as Don actually pulls one of these things out, and let me see if I can hold this one up uh, for us too, you'll see that you don't actually see the chips and that's because right in between, it's actually sandwiched right in there is what you're actually seeing. So it has this nice heat sink on both sides for us. And the reason why is as we load programs, okay, the CPU can't do everything at one time. So it says, let me park some of the information here and then I'll use it as I need to. And that's what it does. The more RAM that you have, in theory, the faster you're gonna be able to access that through the CPU so therefore, the faster your computer is also going to end up working. At one point, the idea of having 64K of RAM was sufficient for everything, okay? Or 60, uh, when I first started, I wanted 64, it was... Uh, 640. 640, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, 640 uh, is, is what, what was actually uh, sufficient. But today, though, okay, the very fact is, as you start to see it, you'll probably see systems that have 4 megabytes or 8 megabytes. 4 is kind of even gone by the wayside. Just about 8 is almost standard today and then 16 and 32, they always are in these multiples, and that's part of the binary system that we've been talking about as well. So you'll see these, and they're sold in those capacities as well, and you, the only thing you have to worry about on these is that they match up and that they'll fit into the slot that's on the motherboard, and that's another consideration as you buy RAM. Don't just go out and go, oh, I just need this much RAM. Well, they're gonna ask you like, well, what, what, you know, what's the RAM that you actually need? Because there's slots in this, and you can see this one here that there's a gap, it fits in that slot. If you buy one and it's not mounted that same way or it's not, it doesn't have that slot, same position, you're gonna break either the RAM stick or you're gonna break the slot is what you're gonna end up doing. And you're gonna waste a lot of money in doing that. So make sure you purchase the one that's correct for your system if you're actually doing something like this and you're actually uh, you know, going to buy RAM. So this is kind of the second fastest component on your actual computer system so that the CPU can access all the information it needs to bring up in that RAM right away. And there is a lot of variety in there. The chip that Ronnie's holding up there has a, a heat spreader on it or a heat sink uh, because it apparently runs at a higher frequency, yeah. gets a little hot. Not, not Most memory doesn't actually right. get hot. So a lot of times when you open a system, it, it will actually just be the chip with no heat spreader on it. Don't freak out if you're yeah. missing a heat spreader. Not every memory needs it. Uh, but also, there's even more expensive memory. See, memory is expensive, the RAM, because it's so fast, it's a high technology, it's expensive. That's why you're kind of limited in how much you can have. Well, there's even faster types of RAM out there that are really expensive. So you can only have a little bit of it, and it's embedded in the CPU itself. Now, if the CPU has to reach out to memory, the further away that memory is, the longer it takes. Well, when I held up this motherboard, you probably noticed how the CPU socket's here and the memory's here. I mean, they are right next to each other. That's not an accident. When they designed the board, they put the memory as close to the CPU as they can if they know what they're doing. If you have a motherboard <laughs> where they're far apart, it's probably not the best design. Well, how could it get even faster if the memory was inside of the CPU? And so when you buy CPUs, you'll actually see these variations. So like with Intel, you have the, the Intel i3 and i5 and i7 and the new i9s, and they each have increasingly large amounts of memory inside of the CPU itself. Uh, the system on a chip on that Raspberry Pi, the memory is inside of the chip itself. Again, it improves speed, and it also reduces cost in that example because it's, it's kind of all embedded in one chip. So lots of variety, but at the end of the day, when we get into to memory, we are usually concerned about the amount that we have. Right. The more memory means the more applications we can have open simultaneously, and the more things we can do at once makes us more productive. Yep. So, um, so RAM, obviously very important. Now, we talk about CPU which is that kind of gatekeeper in between all the various hardware and RAM. We talked a bit about motherboard, uh, and we talked about RAM. What other components do we find on a common motherboard that we need to be aware of? Yeah, on the motherboard itself, there's a couple of other things that are relatively small today, so it's very difficult for us to be able to see. But one is what we call firmware and or BIOS, okay? BIOS stands for Basic Input Output, and I may be mispronouncing it. A lot of people call it BIOS sometimes, but BIOS, basic input output system, and also the idea of firmware. Now that basic input output system, that is a chip of, of memory that has information on it from the factory to help it identify well, all the possible components that can work together as well as what can be plugged in 
so that now when you load an operating system onto the computer itself, the operating system knows how to access well, all those components too. So that has to be a basic function when you first turn on the computer that it can recognize some of this stuff. So if we hold up this board again, we'll just try and point it out a little bit. So this is hard because it's really tiny by comparison. At one point it used to be much bigger, but right next to this black slot, uh, we'll actually show you a close up of this. There's actually this chip that's right there, it's tiny. But if you look at it, it's actually got one of the, the larger pins on the actual board itself by comparison. And that is actually a replaceable unit on this board. Some of them though, Don, are not replaceable, but they are upgradable. So Don, you know more about the idea of flashing <laughs> memory here. So can, let's talk about that a little bit. All right, so you know when it comes to BIOS like this, it's really important. When you push the power button of your computer, the BIOS chip is the first thing to kick in, right? Well, I guess technically the power <laughs> supply kicks in, but the BIOS even gets involved right. in that a little bit. Uh, but it kicks in, and it's responsible for detecting and making sure your hardware is functional. So you actually have this little, uh, they call it a post, a power on self-test your computer runs even before the monitor turns on. So all this stuff is happening very fast when you push the power button, even faster in, in modern computers. In older computers, you can actually watch this process occur. But it does a quick hardware test. And once the hardware test is done, it activates the CPU, the memory, the video card. This is when your monitor wakes up. And then it finds the operating system on your computer. It has to run through this series. And at that point, it turns over control to the operating system. It starts it running. And that's when you see your Windows logo or the Apple logo pops up or the Linux Penguin or whatever it is that you're running starts to pop up on the screen. All that other stuff occurred before the operating system even fired up. And it was done in hardware. Now, that means it needs to work 100% of the time, unlike your operating system, where we're <laughs> lucky if it works 95% of the time, uh, that that firmware needs to, to always be able to boot up. The BIOS always needs to be able to recognize hardware unless there's some kind of physical problem. So at the factory, when they make this stuff, they try and make the chips as stable as possible. Many of them are not able to be overwritten. They're, they're designed to be electrically flashed, and, and they require a UV light to be able to erase and rewrite them, and that's stuff people don't normally have. So if there's ever a bug or a, a failure of some sort in your BIOS, in the, in the old days, they used to mail you another chip, and you'd pull your first chip out and pop your new chip in, and that was your upgrade. Now, it's not really like that anymore. Although, if, if you go out and buy an IT <laughs> toolkit, I don't know right. about yours, Ronnie, but uh, the toolkits they sell even today still have EEPROM <laughs> cores do. in them. Yep. And I don't, I don't even remember what EEPROM stands for, <laughs> but, uh, but that, that's what the old type BIOS right. chips were that you could electrically write and program, uh, which is probably what EEPROM stands mm -hmm. for. But <laughs> anyhow, so, uh, so we don't really have that anymore. Now they're software flashable. You can do updates. You don't have to extract the chip. And since you don't have to extract it, at the factory, they can solder it onto the motherboard, which helps to eliminate something called chip creep. Mm -hmm. Chip creep's a real thing. Uh, over time, as your computer powers on and powers off, as it gets hot, as it gets cold, anywhere you have a removable chip, it can slowly start to work its way loose. In fact, anytime I see a hardware problem like memory not being detected, sometimes I'll just turn the computer off, pop the memory out, and pop the memory back in. They call that reseeding the hardware. And when you reseed it, now it's nice and locked in place, and everything works fine. So because we don't have to remove memory, I mean, uh, uh, BIOS chips like that anymore, they solder them on, and that's the end of it. In fact, on the, uh, the Raspberry Pi that Ronnie was holding up, you can't even see the BIOS chip <laughs> on this one because it is embedded yeah. in the circuit board itself. I mean, I guess maybe if we had some kind of microscope we could <laughs> stick onto our camera here, it's really, really small. Right. Uh, now, most people never upgrade their BIOS, right? But oftentimes it'll introduce things like the ability to support more memory, uh, maybe fix a bug right. or a flaw. There's security improvements that happen. Uh, there were some high visibility CPU vulnerabilities this year that were usually fixed with firmware updates. Uh, so there's, there's things like that that get rolled out as a part of it. But for most of us, it's just another component on the motherboard. And it's not the first one. There's other components on the motherboard that are equally important that people never think about. And a great example of that is the chipset, right? The chipset is almost like a secondary processor that's attached to your motherboard. And it's what determines what kind of storage your system supports and is able to read. It handles if you have other embedded devices. A lot of motherboards these days have video card, sound card, network card, all integrated. And in fact, this one, if we were to look at the backside of it, you can kind of, oh, I'm looking <laughs> in the wrong spot, but uh, you can kind of see there's a whole array of ports along the backside. 
each of these, you know, USB ports, uh, some kind of fiber optic, I'm guessing that's audio. Uh, the, diff. the old keyboard technology, old PS2 keyboards. Uh, we've got all the audio jacks right here. And am I missing network? Oh, yep, yep. right there in front of me. <laughs> uh, it's got a network jack on it. All right, so, so that's a lot of hardware that used to be in the form of cards in older computers, but it's all integrated right here into this motherboard. So what controls that? How, how does that work? How do those guys get connected to CPU? The chipset powers that. And so on your computer, from time to time, you may need to update your firmware, which may update your BIOS, as well as the chipset, as well as any other hardware that might be found on that board. And that's getting to be an increasingly complex task over time. So they had to make it where it was software updatable. They can't be mailing people <laughs> chips. And it, uh, Did you ever upgrade your processor that way, Ron? No, uh, not I processor, your uh, BIOS? I never had to because by the time I decided to upgrade, I had bought a new computer. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, this yeah. is one of those where uh, you know, on a computer today, most of them use BIOS from two different companies. Right. There's a AMI or American Megatrends, and there's Phoenix. Uh, those are the, the two big BIOS manufacturers. Uh, one of them got acquired by Dell, but I can never remember. But we don't need to remember right. because now it's all integrated. We don't even see it anymore. So that's kind of a nice feature. But it also highlights how not every motherboard is created the same. Just like CPUs, we have different types of CPU. We have different types of motherboards. If you want to have 15 hard drives attached to your system. Well, some hard drive or some other boards can do it, some can't. Looking at this one, I've got uh, six SATA ports here. So I could have up to six hard drives attached to this system. If I want eight, I'm going to have to add in a card to do it. Uh, and so you can add storage that way, or you can go external. If I want two CPUs, like Ronnie mentioned with servers, I would need a different motherboard to do that. Um, there's also other components that we haven't really talked about, like the power supply. Right. Right. Your motherboard is usually going to feature, uh, let's see, where is it running? It's usually, oh, <laughs> hidden yeah. behind the memory here. <laughs> this giant connector, I was holding it like this so I couldn't see it, but uh, this giant connector here, that's power. And we're going to need a power supply because otherwise this whole thing doesn't work so well without power. That's another piece of common hardware that we're going to find inside of our computers. Right. So, Don, when we start to, to take a look at it, there's so much that's actually right there for us. And all that goes into just helping us to do what we actually want to do with the computer. Now, Don, we're, we're actually running low on, on time when it comes down to this, but we, we don't want to finish like this. We want to show the idea of the purpose of the computer, talk about the processing as well, but it looks like that we need to do that in a part two is what we need to do. Right, so if you've never seen the BIOS on a system, we definitely want to show that to you. We do have a slight problem, which is that most of the components <laughs> are sitting here on the table, so we need to stick those back yeah. into a case and when we come back in part two, we'll get a chance to see what that firmware looks like. Uh, and we'll even see the, the power on self-test right. that I mentioned and some of all those other things and actually get to see it on the computer in action. So definitely stay tuned for that. Uh, before we wrap up, do you have any other comments to add? No, just remember that every computer system that you run into is not going to look all the same. You will have these common components that Don and I have been talking about. And just uh, be able to work through those, and it will help you out as you start to look whether or not you want to take... Uh, hardware as a consideration for something that you're going to study in the future for your IT career. Yep, absolutely. And if nothing else, they're great troubleshooting skills yes. to help you recognize where a problem might be occurring. All right, well, that is it for our show today. Be sure to stay tuned. We have more CompTIA IT fundamentals coming up, and we have part two of this episode. If you want to see what the BIOS is actually like, we're going to tackle that all coming up. So stay tuned for it. But for now, signing off for IT Pro TV, I'm Don Pazette. And I'm Ronnie Wong. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.